What's going on, everyone? You're listening to the Maya Nation podcast. I'm Alex Miller with the Eagle, joined by Robert Cessna and Travis Brown of the Eagle. a and football season wrapped up last Saturday. The Aggies got the big upset win over number five LSU. Guys, it was a long, long season for the Aggies. Let's 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 grade Adam's performance. We were in here during the bye week. We graded the first half of the season, and then the second half of the season was when things kind of fell off. Cease. Let's start with the offense. How would you grade Adam's offense this year? I think F's the lowest I can go. So with that in <laughs> mind, is it, it would be an F because. Oh, my gosh. They're ranked in the bottom, like, 91, and one of them uh, on total def- I mean, total offense, uh, 101, or sc- scoring and vice versa. It doesn't matter. I mean, I've said this before. Yeah, you'd like to give them an incomplete, but also you can't give somebody an incomplete when it's Jimbo Fisher's fifth year. So you, 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 hopefully you're two or three deep by now, and you can survive. Couldn't even get to six wins or seven wins when you look at it. Uh, just the offensive line, the wide receivers, the quarterback, three quarterbacks, whatever you look at, the tight ends, uh, just got to give them an F. Yeah, there's there's hope in there. You would hope there's hope in there, but just just an easy F. Travis? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to give him an F plus. Because wow, it was, okay, you're nice. It was really <laughs> bad throughout, but exactly what Cease just said there. There, with Connor Wegman coming back, with Evan Stewart, uh, with some of what the running back showed at times, there, there's tools to build on there. I, I, I think the offense is trending for uh, up a little bit towards the end of the season, so I'll give them an F plus because it, it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll give them I'll, I'll I'll give them a little bit of benefit of the doubt at times. I'll give them a D minus. Wow. I'll give them a D minus because at the end of the day, what Wegman was able to do during that last stretch, even though they lost a couple of pivotal games, what he was able to do against Ole Miss, against LSU, was very impressive. Uh, when when they had all their pieces together, like that last game against LSU. You saw what the offense was kind of maybe capable of actually doing if they would have had all those pieces throughout the season. But, yeah, it was a pretty abysmal effort throughout the, re- the remainder of especially the conference slate where they just really did nothing. So I'll give them a D minus, barely getting that diploma, D for diploma. So <laughs> Wow, I wish you were on my college <laughs> professors. I might have got a B in one course. <laughs> all right. Defense probably going to grade a little higher, I would think. C's. Yeah, I, I give them a C plus because they did a lot of good things, but yet they just couldn't get over the hump to me to to make those big plays in huge games. Until you know, when you look at the last game, they beat LSU, but nothing was on the line except pride in there. Uh, run defense, run defense get gets an F minus. I mean, they they took until LSU to get it gone. Uh, Duane Richardson, Antonio Johnson, they had some players, uh, you know, Jack Jackson, even, uh, you know, at linebacker, they were bad at linebacker, but uh, the, the, the guy that started every game. Russell. Russell. He actually was, was somewhat, uh, you know, at least consistent. But just they, they just couldn't get it get it done enough, and you know I blame some of that on the offense. So that why I, why I give them a C plus. Couldn't really go up to a B because I feel B is something you know special. So I'll give them a C plus. Travis, I'm, I'm going to go with a D plus. I, I, oh wow! I, I know cool. that the, the the main objective, the goal of defense is to keep points off the board, and at times, and and for a good chunk of the season, they they did that. They they kept teams down, scoring down. But that being said, the run, like you said, the run defense was abysmal. I mean, they, they there was times at State, you go back to that, where if they needed three yards, they could get three yards. If they, they went forward on fourth down a couple of times in short because they knew they could get it. Um, and you look, coming into the um, the LSU game, A&M actually had the number one pass defense in the country. But that was such a skewed stat because there were so many teams who didn't need to throw against them. I mean, go back to Auburn where they, Uh up until like the last few plays of the first half, they only attempted three passes against them. And that's Auburn. 
who, who, who had a terrible defense. Um, I mean, excuse me, offense. So, yeah, you know, they, and here's the thing. If you're going to grade a defense high, it's p- partly, and it goes either way. You were talking about this with offense or defense. You, they need to be complementary, and complementary in this situation for who A&M was, the defense needed to step up and make some more big plays, like what Damani Richardson did against uh, Arkansas and what he did against LSU returning that fumble recovery. I know holding a defense to the standard of you got to put points on the board for the offense is a pretty high bar, but they needed that this year. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a D, D plus for, uh, for the defense. I'm going to give them a 79.4. Because it's like you you feel like you deserve a B in that situation, but you still get the C, right? So I think that Ano's pass defense certainly pretty good, but like Travis said, a little skewed at times because of teams not really throwing it because they knew they could take advantage of the run. And at the end of the day, the run defense was porous. It was porous the entire season for the most part. You go back all the way to the App State game. Rap State's getting that push on first down, making it manageable on third. Uh, and, you know, a lot of inexperience on the defensive line. How many true freshmen did they start on that defensive line this year? I mean, it was it was kind of staggering how many guys they had up there uh, getting significant snaps, snaps, excuse me. And then <laughs> linebacker, just, you know, very little depth. And, you know, I think if Edger and Cooper would have been able to play a little more, it might have been better at times. But he was injured throughout that middle part of that conference sl- uh, stretch, so uh, yeah, I'll give him I'll give him a C plus. But, but think about it too: if that run defense is just a little bit better, right? They beat Alabama. Mm-hmm. They beat Auburn. They probably beat Ole Miss. They they might beat Ole Miss because that was one of their best offensive performances, and they probably beat App State. I mean, think about how different this season is if that run defense is in the. Uh, the 80s or the 70s and not the 100s. I, I know that's nitpicking apart, but man, that, that defense was supposed to be so much better and the season could have been so much better if they were just just a little bit better. We could say that about the offense at certain points too. If they were just a little better, A&M could have won certain games. If they'd have made one more pass against Alabama, they, yeah. they'd have won. But I, I'm also laughing to myself is the fact that I couldn't think of Chris Russell's name kind of says where the defense <laughs> is. You know, he started every game and, and his name just doesn't come to me because other than Damani Richards and Antonio Johnson, nobody comes to mind real quick on defense yeah. because I mentioned those guys a lot. All right, special teams. Travis, I'm going to start with you. Special teams was interesting. Um, you know, early in the season, I think it was about a C because, you know, Caden Davis really didn't show up like a lot of us thought he would. But then you have uh, Devon, Devon A. Chain run, returning, some, uh, returning a touchdown, and it kind of balanced out. You, you had maybe one of the under underrated breakout players this season. That's Randy Bond coming in and doing a pretty good job as a as a walk on and a guy who's a, who was supposed to be a backup this this whole season. Um, so uh, you, there were and there was a couple of miscues on on punt catches, a couple from uh, uh, Anias Smith and and a few from Moose Muhammad and trying to catch balls and and letting balls go over their head and punt. It was such a, a mishmash. I don't think Nick Constantino had a very good season. No, uh, not at all. For, for, not at all. For what punters have been able to do at A and M, don't think he really had a, had a great season. <sighs> Give him a C. It was just it, it was just average. It, there was some bright spots, but probably not enough. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a C. C. I give him a D because I take the word special off teams because there's nothing special about them. And I know it hurt to have Anaya Smith gone, but they never had that huge plays in a return game. Yeah, their coverage was okay, uh, but they go in, and I give Bond kudos because Davis was supposed to be the guy. He was a bust. Uh, Constantine, you got to remember, every year you think a and punter might be up to win the Ray guy, he wasn't even close this year. It was, and then the blocked field goal, and I know the guy quote was offsides, but he still didn't get them. There was just the, the special teams. I thought they lost about out of the twelve games. They probably lost seven matchups this year if you just looked at the special teams in the games, and that's just really bad. So I'm giving him a D, and, and I think I might be kind to give him a D. 
you think about the kickoff return for a touchdown to open the South Carolina game that really set the tone. Yeah. I mean, Good thing you're here. I mean, <laughs> Anum won. It, you take the last 35 minutes of the game, Anum pretty much dominated that game. But that first five minutes, I mean, they were just skunked. And that was because it all started with that kickoff return, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I give them, I think I give them about a C what you what you had to say, Travis. I, I, I lean toward what you had. It's just another one of those situations. And I know it's like C said, you can say it for any, anything. But it was pretty evident from the beginning of the season that offense was going to struggle. And, and if you know early that the offense is going to struggle, the other phases have to step up. Uh, special teams that usually hasn't been a problem for Anum in the past, and no. so uh, it, it's just another ones that you kind of have to dock them for not stepping up and and helping getting some yardage on kick returns and and things like that w- when it was evident that, that was going to be needed. All right, coaching cease. Got to give him an F because uh, bottom line is there's no way Anum should be five and seven not gone to a bowl game. That's that's just unacceptable. I think Jimbo Fisher would give the staff an F if he was grading almost because nine point five million for him or nine. I guess it's up to nine seven now. You know nine six, and it, it's just been a frustrating year for everybody. And not that you want to give anybody an F. Like if you're a teacher, you don't want to give your student an F. But it's the result of what we all had to endure. I mean, it was bad for everybody, whether you're a media fan or coach, and. Uh, you know, we, t- we touched on it. Moving forward, I'll give them credit for getting to Wegman. I'll give them credit for getting to Bond. But, of course, they didn't start with those guys. So that in fall camp, what happened? Maybe they could say, well, these guys came on as the season went on. So that's a good thing looking forward. You hope it's an F that gets everybody's attention and not an F that goes down. At least I'm giving them an F. Travis? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to get to is that how, how do you not know that you have – uh, Wigman sitting there and of course y- you could say like you said moving through the season through practice that he developed and and, and Jimbo Fisher kind of when we asked in the midseason said it's a whole lot easier to ruin a guy in that situation than it is to make him um, but it seems pretty evident that that uh, Wigman was a guy that was ready to go when when his number was called there early in the season so I, I think you got to dock him for that. The play calling was bad. Uh, the run defense on, on, on defense, the way that they did that, the, the three-man front and how that switched around. There, there was games to be had there, even with how badly they played, and they couldn't overcome that uh, situation. I mean, also something we haven't talked a whole lot about, the way that a offense usually came out of the locker room in the second half where adjustments were – supposed to be made right there that those first couple of drives out of the locker room in a lot of those games were maybe some of the worst spells that the that A&M had um in any of those games uh even go back to the LSU game that was the case those those two Mm. three and outs right out of the locker room um that that's that's right squarely on coaching and you go back to the way that the staff was built up I I still argue with they need a special teams coach. They need a dedicated special teams coach um, in here. And I know there's only so many coaching positions that they can have, but, man, with how bad the special teams were this year, I think that's something that needs to be looked at moving forward. I, I give them an F. It actually started a lot of games poorly, too. We talked yeah. about the South Carolina. We talked about even Sam Houston State. We said like, they're not killing them early. Um, UMass, they started slow. What's funny is uh, when you said that, I go, yeah, right. We never really talked about the they, they, in the past, Jimbo's teams adjusted halftime. I go, well, they, they didn't start good. They didn't start the fir- <laughs> first half or the second half. They just were bad. They <laughs> lost the lead against Ole Miss. They lost the lead against Florida. Mm-hmm. They they let LSU tie the game, and it wasn't until the fumble recovery for touchdown that they were able to regain the lead, and that wasn't even a part of the offense. I mean, we were sitting at that LSU game, and in the third quarter I was like, this is just a repeat of the Florida game. Yeah, like mm-hmm. it, it just really felt like that. The, mm-hmm. I was like, they were they're gonna they're gonna do a repeat of the game. Yeah, so I thought. So, so I thought. I was yeah, wrong. I think I agree with you guys. I've Got to give them an F. I mean, it, at the end of the day, it was it was a failure all around. Well, and and I mean, it's evident by the fact of how many people, how how much conversation is going, calling for a, an overhaul of of the coaching staff and a, and a reevaluation of how maybe plays are called and stuff like that. That yeah, it's, it's you got well, to, and they, to change. And they've already made a change. Daryl Dickey's not returning mm-hmm. as offensive coordinator. I guess we'll see. 
you know, if there's any well, other changes that are going to be made if, once they hire a guy. He was never really the offensive well, corner. He true. was just a contributor. And I kind of feel bad for him that he's the first guy thrown underneath the bus because we all know, and anybody close to football, Daryl Dickey's not the problem with, with the team because I think – he was he did what he was hired to do. He was here to study film and give give uh, suggestions and what have you. Because what I had a laugh is obviously things went well because when they redid his contract last year, he got a raise. So yeah. you don't give somebody a raise. Well, and it was know. it was interesting to see that we never really got to see actually much of of Daryl Dickey's schemes and ideas because he was an up-tempo, throw the ball around kind of coach mm-hmm. when he was calling plays and when he was in charge of the offense and. It, for as much as he was involved with the the, the scheming and the and the scripting of of the offense, it didn't seem like his fingerprints were much on anything that, that, that they did in terms of what his past philosophies offensively had looked like. Yeah, because he came from Memphis, and a lot of people mm-hmm. go, oh, man, Memphis at that time was one of the hurry-up deals, whatever, but, mm-hmm. you know, we'll see moving forward. All right, grade the season <laughs> overall, Travis. I mean, it's it's an F. You 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 first time Jimbo Fisher misses a bowl game, straight up because of of wins. Um, first time A and M hasn't gone played played a bowl game in two years in a row. I know last year was because of of COVID and and whatever situations in a, in a really long time. Um, these SEC schedules with how many non conference games are, are are built in right now, they're built in for teams to to, to be bowl eligible um, and and to not get to six wins. Is is I mean, not where any program wants to be in the SEC. It's it's a it's a hard F. Not to mention, this was probably as wide open as the SEC West has right. been since A and M has been in the league. Right. Alabama was as vulnerable as they've been since 2012. Yeah. Cease, what do you give them? Uh, I got to go with a B because uh, they gave me an a- NIL money. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, didn't have to work for it. You know, no, got to give them an F. We make a lot of jokes. And uh, actually, I was I didn't realize Chase Lane did a I was listening to a local commercial that uh, on the heels of uh he did a local commercial to a place where Wiedemeyer did a, uh, a local commercial. I say, man, uh, both those guys did not have good years. I mean, I mean, and sometimes now I'm looking at that NIL deal. And NIL's, NIL's changed everything. you got to have NIL. But I'm thinking, wow, some of those guys, like the coaches, Jimbo needs to give some of his check back. Some of those players need to give their NIL money back. And, and I know it's, it's, it's what we're moving forward to. But, you know, nobody wins. Nobody wins any money, even the players. You know, the NIL deal. Everybody, it's, it's, a, it's all F the whole way around. Well, well, and that NIL deal is an interesting thing. That's a, the example that you give because Chase Lane just entered the transfer portal. or right. that he's I thought to. about that, too. And so, I mean, the, the, the point, and we always have to clarify, the point of NIL is, is not based anything on what happens on the field. It's just their ability to sell their name, image, and well, likeness. More and, power to them. And, and so y- you can't... Um, you can't tie in uh, incentives or, or performance on the field type of things, but but yeah, it, it is a different landscape in college football with 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 all of these things, and it makes you um, reevaluate kind of how you evaluate college football because of all of it. It's like we're sponsored too, right? So you gotta look, get our sponsors out, get our sponsor out. There, you can't you know? enter the transfer portal. I can't answer no. the transfer. But yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's one of those years, and, and I, I don't, I, you know, sometimes we just got to laugh because it's behind us. I guess that's a good thing. If Cease entered the transfer portal, he would definitely be a graduate transfer, right? Uh, that's debatable. <laughs> he's got, if, I, he's uh, probably got at least one COVID if year. He see my, if he's seen my transcripts, I might not even make it as a graduate. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. To wrap this whole thing up, what, what is the most important thing a and football needs to do in the next month to get the ship turned around as 2023 comes? I, I have to name just one? Uh, <laughs> you can name as many as you want because I think the list is probably long. Yeah. I, I mean, I think this is the low-hanging fruit, but I think, I think the, the, the offense has to modernize, whether that is Jimbo Fisher – does it himself, or he brings in the, the, whoever the new offensive coordinator is going to be in and hand over the reins to play calling? Because um, I, I just don't think, with how the SEC is is built right now, that a ball control um, type offense where you're you are relying on your team 
to get themselves in situation to be in, in third and, and manageable multiple times on a drive and then convert on third down is something that's that's sustainable with how defenses are playing and with how many how much points the other teams usually can put on the board. Um, so I, I, they, they've got to, to, to quote unquote modernize the offense um, and, and make it to where it can put up more than 24, 28 points on the board because um, normally that's not going to win games. That's probably the most important out of a lot of different problems. Sees, you wrote your AM football column this week on AM. Mm. AM's future kind of depends on Jimbo's play call on his play caller. So what do you see as the most important thing? I, I see the number one thing, which I think already has played out. Keep the core of your players. Because if they do that, we've already seen everyone they've lost. I think they'll be able to gain in the portal. I think they'll be able to gain better players than what they've lost if they need to fill those scholarships, depending on how many it comes in. So I think already we're seeing a plus in the fact is they're keeping their core. Because if they keep their core, their core beat – LSU 38-23, and even 31 of those points was by the offense. And as we mentioned, they came out slow. So they could have scored, the offense could have scored 35-40 to 40 against LSU, an old-fashioned offense. So if they keep the core, I like moving forward because I think Wegman, I think, uh, you know, the tight ends look good, younger tight ends look good. Uh, you look at how good Stewart is. The offensive line looked good in the last game, but that you can't. We've learned you can't book a lot on one game because maybe LSU didn't show up. But Cease getting a long answer. I think number one, keep the core. Yeah, I would like to see a little bit more up tempo offense, but I'm not an offensive coach. I do know I can definitely grade what I saw. I didn't like what I saw this year as a, as a rider. It wasn't a good team to cover because you want to cover a winner. You do not want to cover a five and seven. So they've done number one, I think. They've kept the core together because I think a couple guys were already bolted if they're not. That's number one. And then I think else, and we can argue, there might be a lot of number ones because you don't get to be five and seven by, by making one or two mistakes. And what about you? Yeah, no, I, I, you guys took mine. I think what, something I'm curious to see is what's a going to do with this recruiting class? Mm. The early signing period is in February, or excuse me, like three weeks from now in December. They've only got like 11 commits. You know, it seems like they're going to try and maybe use the portal a little heavier this year because Jimbo really doesn't really use the portal a ton in his time at A&M. So kind of curious how they fill, you know, maybe some some needs there. Um, but, you know, what's going to happen with this recruiting class? Because, I mean, you had the number one class last year. This class is far from that. And so uh, to be the elite of the elite, you have to stack those classes on top of each other. I mean, that's how you become the Alabama, the Georgia, the Ohio States. Of the world. Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens in these next couple of weeks because you would think any kinds of staffing issues need to be resolved by that early signing period right. so that those recruits have the confidence of knowing who they're going to be playing for here in these next couple of years. But a couple of the other un unintended consequences, if they are bringing in a new offensive coordinator that's going to completely revamp this offense, does the baseball team miss out on having Connor Wegman because mm. he w might want to stay and, and learn the that, – that was his kind of reasoning why he didn't play uh, as an early enrollee last spring is that he wanted to in, 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 in ingratiate himself into Jimbo Fisher's offense, learn the playbook, uh, be able to, to, to be ready when his number was called. It's, it's kind of that situation again. I, I don't know anything for sure right now, but will the, will the baseball team miss out on that because he might have to choose football um, over baseball? I want to close out with this. Sees how progressive – do you of an offensive coordinator? I know we're not going to get into names or anything mm. right now, but you know, on one end of the spectrum, you you do have like the Garrett Rileys, where it's just mm. absolutely full air raid up tempo, uh, and then there's a spectrum all in between. How progressive, how um, crazy do you think Jimbo will get with his hire, or do you think it's going to start tr be someone who tr who falls decently in line with what where he's at, but maybe has one or two different ideas? Where on that spectrum do you think AM will go? You know, I like to be wrong, which I am a lot. So I think he might try to hire uh, somebody with with opposite of his comfort level, maybe a little more hurry up, tempo, offense, whatever, a younger guy. 
because I don't think Jimbo's going to completely give up the reins. I think mm-hmm. that way he could bring somebody in to complement it. And that's that's just me talking, because I think most people are thinking he's going to go turn over the, the keys completely. I don't think that. I, you know, I, I think that he's – He's just a guy that likes to be in control, but once again, I might be wrong on that. And uh, I know you said you wanted to close with that. I like to close. I put my two cents in for closing. I know one of our most faithful listeners on these is my daughter, Cassie, and she turns 33 today. So today's her birthday. So I want to wish her a birthday whenever she watches this because uh, she's been a blessing for since she came into our life. She was our first. So I'm pretty excited. Happy and, birthday, and, Cassie. And she's Happy my number one fan. Cassie. All right. We've graded A&M's football season. It's basketball season, though. So stick around. We're going to have another segment here breaking down A&M men's and women's basketball.